Right, here we are again. I'm not sure how together I am actually for this, but we are going to find out right now together in real time. So how did Lucifer fall? For any of you unaware, Lucifer is the angel, uh, well, Satan is the angel formerly known as Lucifer, as it were. Um, yeah, let's just jump into it because I, yeah. <laughs> okay, so once I just get to the top of my notes, we're going to find out all about it and um, hopefully take our minds off of current events. Okay, so the story of Lucifer's fall, for anybody who's unaware, is in the Bible, it's scriptural, and it's described in two key Old Testament chapters, and that's those are Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. So we're going to briefly look at both of those, basically. And it would seem, uh, from the context of Ezekiel 28, um, actually, I'm going to start reading them to you. Um, it's just basically the first 10 verses are dealing with an actual human ruler. Um, and then starting from verse 11, which I'll announce, and on through to verse 19, Lucifer is the focus of discussion. So let's let's take a little look. Okay, so remember, 1 to 10 is uh, a human, and then 11 to 19 is certainly not. So Ezekiel 28 begins this way. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to the ruler of Tyre, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart, you say, I am a God, small g, by the way. I sit on the throne of a God in the heart of the seas. But you are a mere mortal and not a God, though you think you are as wise as a God. Are you wiser than Daniel? Is no secret hidden from you? By your wisdom and understanding, you have gained wealth for yourself and amassed gold and silver in your treasures. By your great skill in trading, you have increased your wealth. And because of your wealth, your heart has grown proud. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Because you think you are wise, as wise as a God, I am going to bring foreigners against you. The most ruthless of nations, they will draw their swords against your beauty and wisdom and pierce your shining splendor. They will bring you down to the pit and you will die a violent death in the heart of the seas. Will you then say I am a God in the presence of those who kill you? You will be but a mortal, not a God, in the hands of those who slay you. You will die the death of the uncircumcised at the hands of foreigners. I have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. And now verse 11. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him. So the king of Tyre is being spoken to directly in verses 1 to 10. However, we're now going to see a parallel because the king of Tyre was known as an evil uh, ruler. So this is what the sovereign Lord says. And now we know this, we can see, I'm going to go through it again anyway, but we can see that these are addressed to somebody who is most certainly not a mortal, a mortal. Okay, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, carnelian, chrysolite and emerald, topaz, onyx and jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, certainly not a human, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. 
So I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you and I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end. You will be no more. Pretty serious, um, if I may say so. Okay, so what is the logic behind um, our conclusion that these later verses refer to the fall of Lucifer? So whereas we saw in the first 10 verses, um, they're speaking about um, this ruler of Tyre who was condemned for claiming to be a god, um, though he was obviously just a man. The discussion uh, moves to the king of Tyre starting in verse 11. So it's about him and then it's to him, as it were. And many scholars uh, believe that through, that sorry, though there was a human ruler of Tyre, I should have closed my window, sorry about the sirens. So though there was a human ruler um, of Tyre, a real historical figure, the real king, as it were, um, was Satan, if that makes sense for the moment. For it was he who ultimately was at work in this anti-God uh, city, basically. And it was he, Satan, who worked through the human ruler of the city. So some have suggested that these verses may actually be dealing with a human king um, who was empowered by Satan. Um, perhaps the historic king of Tyre was a tool of Satan only or even indwelt by Satan. So in describing this king, Ezekiel uh, gives us a look into the superhuman creature, Satan, um, who was using, if not actually indwelling, um, this king. So there are things that are true of this king that at least ultimately cannot be said of human beings. Um, obviously, the king is portrayed as having a different nature from man, i.e. he's called a guardian cherub, and a cherub in and of itself is a different creature. That's verse 14. He had a different position from man, i.e. he was blameless and sinless. Um, and since Adam and Eve, that has not been the case for us, and that's verse 15. He was in a different realm entirely from man, um, the holy mount of God, which is verses 13 and 14. He received a different judgment from man. He was cast out of the mountain of God and thrown to the earth. Um, that's in verse 16. And the superlatives which are used um, to describe him just don't seem to fit that of normal human beings, i.e. full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, not just beautiful, perfect in beauty and having the seal of perfection. That's like, you know, pretty impressive accolades. So who is Lucifer um, and why did he rebel? Our, so the text that we're looking at tells us that this king was a created being um, and left the creative hand of God, as it were, in an absolutely perfect state. And that's Ezekiel 28, 12. He remained perfect in his ways until iniquity was found in him. That's the beginning of Ezekiel 28, 15. And what, so what was this iniquity? That's what we need to know. So we see in Ezekiel 28, 17, your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So Lucifer apparently became so impressed with his own intelligence, his own power, his own beauty and his own position um, that he began to desire for himself the glory and uh, the honour that is only ever due to God, like alone. That's it. That's It belongs to him. He's worthy of it. Um, and there are no other takers, as it were. So the sin that corrupted him was, not only was it self-generated because his own beauty, his own intelligence, his own bloody, bloody, blah, like got him there. But ultimately, it's the sin of pride, which... I can't remember if I've recorded it. Yeah, uh, Spurgeon speaks very well of that, and so does C.S. Lewis, how um, spiritual sins are, it's Lewis, yeah. He speaks of carnal sins as being um, of lesser ultimate importance, not to God, but to us, um, and also to Satan, because Satan can use pride to make us feel very uh, religious, 
and very proud of ourselves and very, you know, like noses in the air when actually we're, st we're just walking straight towards hell because we're so proud that we're now uh, not sleeping around as it were, but it's still the pride, not the Holy Spirit, who's that is enabling us uh, to, you know, perform these miracles as it were. So self-generated pride. Uh, God did not instill this in him as it were. He cultivated this. And apparently uh, this, well, not apparently, it, it is apparent as it were, that this is actually the beginning of sin in the entire universe. So props to Satan as it were, Lucifer as he was then called. Um, it's, yeah, it, it precedes Adam's um by an indeterminate time, I should say, there's no time frame available other than that it's prior um, to the fall of human beings. Um, yeah, so it, it's original sin, but it's only original for humans, as it were. So sin actually originated um, in the free will of Lucifer, in which, with full understanding of all of the issues, he chose to rebel against what balls? I've got to say it. Like, I'm not impressed, but... Like he's got some uh, front, let's put it that way. He chose to rebel against the king of the universe, the creator of all things, like the author and sustainer of our faith. He just went, meh. <sighs> Anywho, so this, um, yeah, this mighty angelic being was rightfully judged by God who says this in verse 18, I threw you to the earth. Um and this actually, it doesn't, on the surface, that seems like an expulsion and that's that. Um, but it doesn't mean that he had no no uh, subsequent access to heaven. Because um, if you think about it, at least Job uh, chapter 1, 6 to 12, Zechariah 3, like the very beginning, 1 and 2, um, show that he actually maintained some form of access um, even after he fell. However, Ezekiel 28, 18 indicates that Satan was absolutely and completely, utterly cast from God's heavenly government and, um, and his place of authority. Um, and that's referenced in Luke 10, 18. Let's see if I can find some of the notes that I had, because I've got, actually, I may as well just whiz through these. So Job, uh, just the, the part that's relevant. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. He's no longer referenced as Lucifer, you see. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth upon it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? So we need not go on. We've established his um, presence in, in the literal presence of God and also in heaven. Um, Zechariah 3, 1 to 2 says this, if you remember your Old Testament. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? So it's pretty strong language again. So that's, we've placed him again there. I feel like I'm doing some sort of CSI um, show. Okay, so now finally, well not finally, but the last one in this little uh, group, it's a very short one, and it's Luke 10, 18. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So that's uh, where he was coming from, and we know where he came to. Okay, then, so let's carry on uh, where we were. Right, so that's up to Luke 10, 18. So Isaiah 14, again now, uh, 12 to 17, is another um, Old Testament passage that may refer to the fall of Lucifer. Um, and it's worth pointing out at this at this stage that some Bible scholars see no reference whatsoever um, to Lucifer within this passage. It's argued that the being mentioned in the verse is referred to as a man, um, which is verse 16, um, compared with other kings of the earth, which is 18. And the words, how you have fallen from heaven in uh, 12 is allegedly with these uh, detractors of the, the uh, theory that it does refer to Lucifer 
it's alleged uh, to refer to a fall from great political heights. Mm. Okay, so let's take a look at ourselves. And that is Isaiah 14, 12 to 17. Let's find it. Oh, I just scooted past. Okay, so 12. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. Doesn't really sound like Donald Trump. Um, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. And, of course, angels are um, also referred to as stars and, uh, you know, all of the names are known by God. That's not in this verse, by the way. So he will um, raise his, he says, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, which can be interpreted as above the angels of God. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Oh, okay, that sounds pretty like satanic uh, to me. But, uh, you know, who am I to interpret these things? Oh, yeah, someone with the Holy Spirit. Okay, then, so let's uh, carry on. Right, um, yeah, so they're saying that, I mean, potentially it could be political, but it doesn't sound like it to me. So there are other scholars huh, who interpret the passage as referring only to the fall of Lucifer with no reference at all to any human king. Um, the argument here is that the description of this being is beyond humanness, <laughs> beyond, yeah, beyond um, the scope of referring to a human, and therefore it cannot um, and it does not refer to a mere mortal. So there's also a third view um, that is potentially preferable to both of those definitely is and definitely isn't. Um, and we see this This is not common, I wouldn't say, but there are some dual prophecies in the Old Testament, things that can be fulfilled twice, like with a different slant on it, if that makes sense. Um, so Isaiah 14, 12 to 17. Um, it may be that verses 4 up until 11 deal with an actual king of Babylon. And then verses 12 to 17 um, are dual references that include not just this king of Babylon, similar with the king of Tyre earlier, um, but is a typological description of Lucifer at the same time. Um, yeah, I, I think that's pretty reasonable. So if this passage contains a reference to the fall of Lucifer, then the pattern of this passage would fit that of Ezekiel 28 also. Um, that is first, a human alone is described and obviously like not a very nice one. And then these double references, things that can, because it flows forwards from the description of the first human, it can then um, refer dually. You can take it as a sole reference to uh, Lucifer also. Um, and it's significant that the language used to describe um, this being fits other passages in the Bible that speak about Satan. For example, the five I wills in Isaiah 14. Let's have a look, um, which indicate an element of pride. So let's take a look at those Isaiah 14. And now I have to find them. Gosh. OK, give me two seconds of speed reading. Uh, shucks um okay yeah I, I think so okay let's get back right i'm wondering so god does a bit of eye willing as it were let's see all right yes 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 i think so you have been cast down to the earth you who once laid low the nations you said in your heart i thank you you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. What an absolute stunning cheek. I can't believe it. However, um, the, if you read on um, at 22, uh, Yahweh starts I willing and it's much more impressive I'll just read you a little snip I will rise up against them declares the Lord Almighty I will wipe out Babylon's name and survivors her offspring and descendants declares the Lord 
I will turn her into a place for owls and into swampland. I will sweep her with the broom of destruction. Surely, as I have planned, so it will be. And as I have purposed, so it will happen. I will crush the Assyrian in my land on the mountains. I will trample him down like it goes on and on. I think he's a little bit irked at that point. Uh, and rightly so, because it is God. Okay, so let's get back to where I was. Um, yeah, they indicate, um, like these are the ways that Satan is described. So Ezekiel 28, 17. Also, 1 Timothy 3, 6. Um, let's see if I already, yes, I did. I'm very organized sometimes. Okay, so let's have a look at this reference to uh, Satan here. When I just, oh gosh, let me get somewhere else because some ad blocker. So first Timothy three six. Um okay, it says he must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. So he's not referenced as Satan or Lucifer there, but his like job description as it were, his um his role, which is the devil, but it speaks of his conceit and the I will statements are obviously um, indicative of his arrogance and uh, just general showboating. Like it's like the baddies in most, you know, like children's things. They give away all their plans like <laughs> openly um, so they can be thwarted because God sees the wiles of the evil and he thwarts them. Okay. Right. Where are we? So as a result um, of like the, one of the most serious, if not the most serious sins against God, like pretty despicable. Lucifer was banished from living in heaven. We see this in Isaiah 14, 12. He became corrupt and his name changed from Lucifer, uh, morning star, which is not solely attributed to Lucifer, by the way. That's a, a thing of glory, morning star. That's also used to refer to Jesus. It's not as is sometimes put around in silly viral videos, that they are both the same person. They are both being attributed with the glory um, of the morning star. And his, his name then changes to Satan, the adversary, the accuser of the brethren, um, a murderer from the beginning, the father of lies, etc., etc. all the bad stuff, as it were. Um, his power became completely and utterly perverted. There's nothing left of any... Um, yes, yeah, sympathy for the devil is like it's an odd position. Um, I can't say that I haven't had it when I was a lot younger. I felt sorry for Cain, I felt sorry for Lucy, like I just did because I, th especially Cain, I thought like there's three whole humans on the planet and then there's four. How is he supposed to know that picking up a rock and hitting someone on it? Like, I just you know, I did a little bit of um defense attorneying as it were in my imagination for him, anyway. So as a result of this thing, his name changes. He becomes the adversary. He's already the adversary, but he is now um, directly implicated in um, all of the crimes, basically, that have, uh, that have ever happened um, against God, at least. I don't mean like civil crimes, like calling a man a she or something. So his power was utterly perverted. We see that in Isaiah 14, 12, and we see it in 14, 16 and 14, 17. His destiny um, following the second coming of Christ, um, at, you know, end times, is to be bound in a pit. Uh, firstly, during this, during the thousand year millennial kingdom, uh, which Christ will rule over. That's Revelation 20, uh, verse 3. And eventually, um, yeah. It is the game, like not the game, but it's rigged. There's no way he's getting out of it. God's plan is ineffable. It's um, unpervertible. It, it, you know, God is sovereign. And like he said um, in one of the verses that I was just reading, as I have willed it, so it will happen. And when it's God saying that, you can bet your bottom dollar or any currency you choose that that is going to be the case. And that is why I'm so very thankful for God's promises. Um, one of my favorites. I'm just going to share it with you. I often think about, you know, with reporting so much on persecuted Christians, I often um, make a note of, of verses that speak about persecution and the blessings that come with them. And, you know, I think they're very um, reassuring. 
But one of my old, I always say one of my favorites, and I know there's at least five or 10 in my head that spring forward, but Jeremiah 29, 11, let me just read it because it's so beautiful um, and because I feel like it. Um, yeah, that's it really. All right, let's find it. Oh no, I don't want to do it on this screen, do I? Because then I won't be streaming anymore, I don't think. All right, let's, let's open up another tab then. That would help. So let me cancel that. See, this is what happens when you innovate. This is probably why Muslims are against it. Right, um, Jeremiah. Okay. Now we're off by heart, but I just, oh, it's the NIV. Ah, oh, whatever. Okay. Yes, okay, I'll accept this translation. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Like just how, oh, I love it. I just, I do, I love it. And I'm not ashamed uh, of the gospel. And I'm not ashamed that I love it either. Also, while you're while you're at it, uh, Romans eight twenty eight, all things, all things that that includes spoiler alert, all things. Nothing that is a thing is outside of all things. All things work to the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Whether or not we can see the good in the current is quite frankly irrelevant. Because if God, um, through the, the writers of the Bible, says these things, they are a certainty. You can take them to the bank for what it's worth. You can, like, you can rely and you can trust in the Lord. And, um, and that's just the end of the matter. There's no, even though I do love a debate, there is no debate around that. That's a certainty. So... I think I might have uh, just wrapped it up nicely. Lucifer is um, no more, unfortunately. He is now Satan. He is the accuser of our brethren. He is the perverter. He is the um, the father of lies. You may vaguely recognize that title from somebody who's the best of planners, plotters, deceivers, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I may have, <laughs> spoiler alert, I may have some more to say on that in the next, what are we now? The next, say, two to three days. But, um, yeah, it's pretty odd researching uh, Satan. But somebody's got to do it, and it looks like it's me. On that very odd bombshell, as it were, um, yeah, I hope that, like, literally don't have nightmares. Um, Lucifer is an already, sorry, Satan is already defeated. Christ has all, we are literally, we are fighting an already defeated enemy. That's not to say that in and of ourselves, we have the strength to, um, you know, to repel him or to cast him out. But by the name of Jesus, the only name worth knowing under heaven and earth that can set men free from the curse that was placed upon us at the behest, basically, of Satan, at his, uh, you know, instigation, at least. Um, the name of Christ, the name Yeshua, the name of Jesus, whatever um, your mother tongue deems his name to be, other than Isa, because that's just a disgusting uh, translated word. Yesu is the Arabic. Yeah. With Jesus, all things are possible. If God is with you, who can be against you? That includes Satan. And um, we're Paul tells us, Saint Paul, uh, as he was later known, but I just call him Paul. Paul tells us, um, take captive every thought and conform it by the power of the Spirit to the image of Christ. If you take captive your thoughts, um, Satan has much less of um like remit there he he has no power over any christian however the power that he does have lies and deception and it's lies and deception <laughs> so don't let him fool you that god is not uh mighty and almighty at that that he's already beaten he's um a bit of a tip basically even though the bible does there's one instance where um i think michael the archangel is loath to insult him and just says i rebuke you I haven't got that angelic wisdom, so I don't mind really because 
you know, look at what he's doing around, look at what he's doing through human beings, assisting them in Pakistan to cause just the atrocities that we see against young ladies and young Christian ladies there. However, however, I'm going to end on this. Um, one of Satan's great, like he would never have the front. He, he had the balls to, uh, you know, to sin in the first place. Um, however, he doesn't have the audacity to deny the existence of God, um, as all demons know there is one God. Um, however, what he does deny quite convincingly and quite in a Machiavellian kind of uh, plot twist, he denies his own existence. And this is this is my reasoning for his, um, you know, why he would do that. Some a, a creature of such immense pride and arrogance and narcissism and all of those kind of, you know, you would assume that he would want his image and his name everywhere and it, to be a, like evil acts to be attributed to him. However, I think it's pretty clever because if we disbelieve in him. Not only are we closer to disbelieving in angels and disbelieving, like it just is, uh, it's incremental. Next thing, it's easier to not believe in God, like eventually down that scale. However, I don't think that's his motivation. I think his motivation is that if he, if we refuse to accept that he is a reality, then we have to attribute all sin and all degradation to ourselves. Um, the devil made me do it. It's like on T-shirts and stuff like that. But he would r much rather, I th I'm not a spokesperson, by the way, but I feel that he would much rather you believe that you are the sole source of uh, misery and evil in your own life. You know, and some of the evil perpetrated around the globe uh, today and for all time. I, you know, I don't think demons have got that much imagination, but I do think they've got depths that we, uh, you know, that we don't share collectively, that aren't a part of our DNA, because obviously the curse is, um, you know, only skin deep, as it were. It's We weren't ultimately created for that. We still have um, goodness as a baseline. It's just that we can't access it until we reconnect with the ultimate goodness and the ultimate truth and the ultimate way and the ultimate light that is Jesus Christ. I'm going to get off my pulpit <laughs> right now because it's all getting a bit, uh yeah, I'll have to start banging the tambourine um, any minute now. Okay, so I'm glad I feel a little bit better, actually, than when I did my uh, stream earlier. I hope I've uh, taken your mind off some of those atrocities, and I hope I've brought it back to Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of my faith. I'm sure he is yours. Um, if you're not a Christian and you're watching, like, what's the harm? If you're Certainly, if you're an agnostic or an atheist, most atheists are not anti-theist. Um, I think, I don't know about most, because most statistics are made up, but I think they're more angry at God um, and therefore admitting his existence. So if you're just like casual about it all, but you're not fully convicted by the Holy Spirit, that's not as painful as it sounds, by the way. Just chuck up a little prayer tonight. No one will be watching. Nobody will know except you and except Jesus who tells us that, you know, our Father sees us in secret um, praying these things. Just ask for him to to show you that he's real. Choose your words carefully as well, because I prayed that prayer once and I'll tell you all my testimony one day and it was like, well, I don't want to put people off, but it was pretty definitive, let's put it that way. Stop rambling, Kay. Say goodbye to the nice people, Kay. All right, lots of love. See you later. Bye.